Uh, welcome to everybody. Looks like we've got uh, 48 participants in the audience who we cannot see. And let's see, we've got a little poll for you. So I want to know a little bit about you because of the online setup. So we can't, can't see you. So we, we're curious if you can tell us a little bit about who you are. What's your professional background? Where is your region of origin? So where are you from or where are you based? But where are you from is probably more interesting. And why are you interested in this topic? So if you can respond to that, and let's see, you should be able to see this poll now. Um, and aha, uh -huh. okay, so here we've got the results. So a third are you, of you, no, sorry, yeah. Oh gosh, no, 84% of you are from university, okay. No surprise there, but we have some people from the private sector. Um, we have somebody from nonprofit and somebody from other no government people. Most of you are based in Europe or the UK, some in Asia, US, Latin America. One person awake very early or from Australia, <laughs> Oceania. Uh, and you're interested in this topic be mainly because of you do research on this. Uh, also because of activism and simply interested because you're concerned about this from a personal perspective, uh, or so it's part of your education, you're interested in policy making or something else. Okay, good, so we have an overview of who's there. Sorry that we can't see you. Um, but to begin this, I guess I should just quickly introduce myself. I, I'm an environmental social science research fellow in the Environmental Change Institute. Uh, at the University of Oxford. And I'm very excited to, to chair this panel of fantastic people tonight. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, partly because environmental justice has emerged as a really critical issue now in an era where we have alternative facts about the environment. We have skepticism about science, continued patriarchy and systemic racism, and they're all coming together. Um, Environmental human rights defenders are people who strive to protect and promote human rights relating to the environment. And their work is crucial, but it's of, often underappreciated. Around the world, we have heard stories of the persecution of environmental defenders to the point of murder in some places. And I was just looking up earlier today and it, it turns uh, The Guardian had an article in July this year that 212 uh, land and environmental activists were killed in 2019. That's a lot of people. Uh, much has also been made of, for instance, climate activist Greta Thunberg's Asperger's condition, which has been credited for shielding her from the numerous vicious and personal attacks on social media that she's faced. There's a lot of people out there who find it necessary to attack people who are defending the environment. So what does it take to continue to stand up uh, and, and fight this fight? And how do environmental defenders, environmental defenders confront these closed power spaces? Um, so we're here tonight to listen to, or tonight, or wherever you are, morning maybe for you, uh, to listen to stories by practitioners by, and activists and researchers who and have a discussion around what this means in 2020 and beyond. So just to quickly give you an overview of how the event's going to be organized, each panel member has been given seven minutes to speak and to tell us their thoughts on this topic and their experiences, and I'll introduce each person before they speak. And then I will ask one or two questions based on what they say. And after that, I'm going to open the floor to the audience. So we have simultaneously, if you want to type questions into the chat box, that would be fantastic, especially if you're in a noisy environment and it might be difficult for us to, to understand you if you speak up. Uh, we're going to be keeping an overview. So luckily, I'm not alone. There's an entire team of people here who are supporting this. We're going to be keeping an overview of the questions that are asked in the chat box. Uh, and then we can uh, kind of see what's happening there, who's asking what, and, and try to go between the chat box and also some live questions. Um, so, yes, and I think that was what I wanted to say about that. Okay, good. So I'm actually just gonna go straight into this now, and I'm going to ask Tracy Kajumba to start. Um, Tracy is a principal researcher at the International Institute for Environment and Development. And um, Tracy, originally from Uganda, 
and she works on a wide range of projects, including public policy engagement, gender and climate change, resilience programming and evaluation and climate risk assessments. And she's worked for CARE, for World Vision and other development actors, and is going to give us the view, I hope, from both a development practitioner as well as from a researcher. So Tracy, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Lisa. As mentioned, I work with the International Institute for Environment and Development as a principal researcher. And today's topic is really a global issue. Climate justice and environmental justice are really principles that are intertwined and the activists and defenders face similar challenges globally. But before we go into their roles and uh, their challenges, I wanted us to re reflect on who these people are. Generally, these are least responsible for climate change or environmental degradation, but suffer the greatest, the gravest consequences of these two uh, evils. And uh, in, individually, they are individuals and collectives who protect the environment and protect, protest and just and, and sustainable resource use. They are indigenous people who have faced social, economic and polit political exclusion over the centuries. They are peasants, fishermen, pastoralists, whose lives and livelihoods are threatened by environmental changes and climate hazards. They are social movements, journalists, CSOs, who actively defend environment because the ecosystem abuse has reached unacceptable levels. They are women who depend on the environment for their livelihoods and everyday lives, water, firewood, everything. But then they're exposed to intersectional discrimination, looking at issues of race, class, ethnicity, gender inequality, which reduce the adaptive capacity. And they're also the poor and landless who have been dispossessed of their land, their livelihoods and their dignity due to businesses that do not follow responsible business conduct where we see lots of abuse of human rights. And most of these organizations are raiding on corruption in governments where nothing much can be done about some of them. And largely of recent, we are seeing a big group of the youth and young people who have been left out of policies, decision-making processes, and they are fighting intergenerational inequality and fighting the threats to their future due to the destruction of the natural world. And the fact that these are the people experiencing these issues and are really not the rich or the, in those positions where they can make decisions, their role is really, really important and it's coming to the forefront. The rise of powerful protests on every issue, including climate and environment, largely led by the youth and young people. We see civil society media, grassroots activism is also increasing and it's really promising for justice and equality going forward. And uh, they have strengthened the global campaign on climate action. They've challenged uh, climate ambition, which is not really up to speed. They have brought to light environmental and degradation issues that we cannot see. We are researchers, we are civil society, we are universities based somewhere, but we don't experience the everyday things that they know. So they bring all this evidence, they bring their lived experiences and their, the, the things they are doing to really come out of those problems. Some of them have worked with governments and pressurized to increase co-management of resources and benefit sharing and also bringing in the citizen awareness and engagement where people know about their rights and entitlements and as well as monitoring the global and national commitments on environmental justice. So they are the ones that keep the fire burning. We, we don't do that most of the time and otherwise we would not maybe know what is going on. And uh, in, around climate, they brought a lot of pressure on developing countries to assume historical responsibility and supporting uh, developing countries to adapt because they contribute less to the problem, but they really suffer all the challenges. Uh, doing this work has not been easy. There are challenges that they experience. Uh, first of all, we've seen state impediments to civil society space. 
and organizations that work on human rights. The SDG report 2019 highlighted the gaps in promoting the rule of law, strengthening institutions and, and increasing access to justice, but largely also noted the increasing rise of attack on human rights activists and the journalists that are talking about issues of climate and environment. We also see that poor governance prevails, which is a cause of poverty and exclusion. And that also limits the activists in terms of getting to government to change policy and practice. We see decisions that are top down and policies that are top down and siloed, not giving opportunity to these people with lots of knowledge and experience of the real issues being parts of the process. And in some countries, human rights based approach, climate justice approach are seen as anti-government. And we've seen sustained assault and attack on civil service space, the anti-civil society legislation, the restrictions on access to foreign funds, the confiscation of property of civil societies working on accountability and governance issues are all impediments to the defenders. And sometimes also around uh, adaptation, the, the, the policy positions put by civil society sometimes are seen as not very relevant because they are not technical enough to pre prevent a, present a paper that a government will think is useful. And yet they are presenting the data of things that they are really experiencing. They may not have written it well, but those are the real issues. So we've seen also evidence from civil societies discredited as well. And uh, so what do we need to do to support them to really uh, increase this activism and cause change? Uh, first of all, I really want to thank the university for having these discussions and the other universities as well who are focusing on this. Uh, it's really important because they see universities as important in brokering knowledge between the university, the policymakers and practice. Publishing journal articles is not enough. We need these recommendations to go to the decision makers, to go to governments, but most of all, to work with these organizations that are involved in activism so that their capabilities improve and their knowledge is really respected. Uh, otherwise, because it's looked at like not useful at the moment. And um, the other issue I want to look at is the, the decolonization of knowledge that we all really need to focus on. The thinking that we know it all, we are better, the communities don't know anything is what is making everything fail, that is making policies that are not pro people and are not fit for purpose. I think we need to respect indigenous knowledge and lived experiences. During this COVID pandemic, we have seen very good examples of strong local institutions that have been able to respond, to plan with government, to even support government in communities where people could not afford to buy soap. They've been given skills to make soap. We work with partners who have been doing that. And I mean, for sustainable results, we really need to strengthen their capabilities and their agency to be able to do that. The inclusion of women and gendered local experiences is in, important in disrupting dominant policy discourse where we keep excluding these groups and also ground technical debates in practical realities other than following textbooks and research that is not based on the issues that are happening. And the funding is also very important. Access to funding is a key issue. It's not only for the defenders, it's an issue for the developing countries. It's an issue for civil society. And the practice is that funding goes to big organizations who can write good proposals and who can account for the money. The small organizations who are at the forefront of fighting on these issues are always discredited, like they don't have capacity to do this, but they can only be supported through patient and progressive processes that increase their capability to be able to do their work, but also to be able to manage their internal governance processes. And uh, lastly, uh, in our response to climate change, we need to be careful not to create inequitable adaptation responses, where adaptation is pro pro projects are going on, programs are going on, but the real people are not benefiting, those who are affected. 
uh, IID and partners uh, just concluded the co community-based adaptation conference, which was is a global conference. And we had voices of the youth saying that we hear about adaptation, we hear about funds, but we don't know what happens and we are not part of it. And when you look at the statistics, for example, over 60% of the population in the coming years is, is the youth. In Africa already, 63% of the population is youth. They're all young people. So if you don't include them, if we don't make them part of the decisions, then there's no future that we are talking about. So if we, we need to do these things to make sure that really activism is supported and the fire keeps burning, otherwise we are destroying the world as we look on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, um, Excellent. Oh, if, oh, I've already written down a couple of questions that I have for you later, so um, good. Um, so just to remind the, the um, attendees that I made a mistake, please don't put your questions in the chat box. Please put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, yes. So that would be easier for us to keep an overview. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so we're going to move on. And um, now I'm going to ask Patrick, Patrick Ali, to speak. So Patrick Ali is one of the founders of Global Witness, which is an NGO that focuses on corruption, uh, conflict, resources, forest and land, and environmental defenders. And in 2012, he co-conceived the organization's work, which uh, was to document the attacks and criminalization of land and environmental defenders. So Patrick, welcome. Um, go ahead, you have your seven minutes. Thank you very much uh, for asking me. <clears throat> um, at the risk of sounding like something from a bad Hollywood movie, um, I genuinely believe that the, the future of the planet is, is in the hands of two opposing forces. I think there are, there are those in pursuit of endless consumption, endless profit and limitless growth. And those are the people I regard as the ideologues, uh, because we all know that unlimited growth in a finite world is a fiction. And the other opposing force are those people who want a sustainable, more equitable future where people can thrive and where we can strive for equality. Um, and I think that way lies the only practical answer. And I think we're seeing some of this play out in the US right now. Um, I don't know who's going to win that struggle. I genuinely think it's in the balance. Um, and what I do know is that we all need to work together to play our part. I'm saying this quite seriously because I think we're in a, a really serious place. Um, and so we need to work closely together. And this is one of the, the key reasons that Global Witness works um, to support the rights and, and aspirations of land and environmental defenders, because without them, we certainly cannot win this battle. And, and as Lisa said in her introduction, it is actually a bit of a battle. It's a shooting war um, on the front line. Global Witnesses um, introduction to this came about in 2012 because one of our colleagues, someone who used to work for us in Cambodia, a Cambodian forest activist was murdered. Um, and it was at that point we thought, well, we know we hear of these attacks, we hear of these killings but it never happened to anyone we knew before. Um, and for that reason, we thought, well, how many people are killed? How many people are criminalized? How many people are attacked? And so we set out to document that because we thought at least one thing we can do is to raise the profile of the issue by putting some numbers to it. Um, and we produce an annual report um, and you, Lisa, in fact, quoted from it. Um, you might've quoted The Guardian, but they quoted from it. Um, 2019 was the most dangerous year on record uh, for the killings of land and environmental defenders with 212 murders. And I would stress that this is a vastly underreported figure. We only print uh, or publish uh, statistics when we know the, the cause of death and the identity of the person. Every one of those 212 people is named uh, in our report. 40% of those killed are indigenous people, although indigenous people only represent 5% of the global population, but protect, as Sonia Guajajara, a prominent indigenous leader in Brazil, told me last week, 80% of the land. Uh, 34 people were killed 
uh, by agribusiness or, or defending the land against agribusiness, 50 against mining and extractives, which is going to include coal, oil, et cetera, and therefore completely climate relevant, 24 from uh, logging related uh, activities. Um, there's a whole list of stuff I could go through, but th those are some headlines. Um, on average, four land and environmental defenders have been killed every week since the Paris Climate Agreement. And we know, if you look at the Amazon, which is completely critical to mitigating the impact of climate change, around 60% of the deforestation there is related to the beef industry. Um, adding another dimension to this, and this has been talked about quite widely in the press, the impact of COVID has been disproportionately severe on indigenous people and local communities. There was a guy uh, in Oxford last year at the Skullwell Forum, a guy called Santos, who was the, the governor of the Kogi people, who spoke very movingly at the forum. He died um, a couple of months ago. Chief Aritana of the uh, Yawalapiti people died of COVID, um, much mourned in Brazil uh, about a month ago. And we know that COVID itself is the result of humankind's exploitation of the planet. Um, but it's not all doom. Um, there are solutions. We're working on some of them. And as I said at the beginning, we all need to work together much more closely. Um, and we genuinely believe that land and environmental defenders are the front line um, in, in defense of our planet and relating to climate impacts. Um, and we need to amplify the demands of those defenders as widely as we can. And we need to look at the causes here. And Tracy talked about some of these, but in the global witness context, for example, we need to be pushing people in power. We need to be pushing businesses. We need to be pushing the financiers. The beef industry in the Amazon is financed by international banks. We produced a report relatively recently that showed that around $46 billion worth of finance was provided by 300 banks to so just six companies uh, involved in deforesting in the Amazon, just by way of example. Um, we need to look at the commodity traders, the people trading the palm oil, the soy, the sugar, the beef. Um, the European Union is going to be passing legislation next year looking at mandatory supply chain due diligence, looking at social and environmental harms. Um, the legislation will happen, how strong it will be is up for grabs. We, you know, those of us who are into advocacy need to be focusing on that. And I'll finish just again by mentioning something that Sonia Guadagara said to me last week, just to spur a bit of debate, capitalism equals destruction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And yes, um, you brought up the the elephant in the room in some ways, the election that's happening outside here. I was hoping to, <laughs> wouldn't have to think about it, but of course this is a really relevant and what you're saying is also extremely, um, echoes the, a lot of these issues and the reason we're so concerned uh, about this. I think now, I mean, um, yes, okay. So thank you. And that complements also Tracy's points uh, about the, who, the voices that are not getting heard and your message that we need to amplify these voices. Uh, so we're, we'll hopefully get back to that. Uh, um, good, okay. And then I'm going to move on to Anissa, Anissa Khan. Uh, Anissa Khan is Indian born and, and uh, raised in Oman. She's joined the climate movement by organizing for justice and equity at the UN Climate Talks, where she worked to make sure that the voices of frontline youths were heard over those polluting industries. And she's also worked uh, as an organizer for Friends of the Earth International, the Wilderness Society, and most recently Sustain US, uh, which is a youth-led climate justice organization where she is the executive director. So uh, Anissa also works right now on creative communications for Oil Change International. Welcome Anissa and please go ahead. Thank you, Lisa. And hi everyone. It's such, a, such an honor to be here and to be on this panel with, um, with all of you as well. Um, like Lisa mentioned, my name is Anissa. Uh, I'm the executive director of Sustain Us, and we're a youth-led climate justice organization where we really know in our blood and bones that our futures are being put at risk by the systemic injustice of climate change. And we're a 
community and an organizing community of young people between the ages of 18 to 29 from diverse geographies and identities across the United States from indigenous youth across the country to young people living in American coal country to those on the front lines of the fires that are burning down the west coast of the US um, almost every year now. And we train one another in mobilizations, media, and solidarity organizing skills so that we can work together for climate justice. Um, and I'm going to be talking today kind of from that perspective of, of what it's like to be a uh, um, young active, like climate justice activist uh, of color, and what it's like for us to organize together as young people on the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, and in Sustain Us, something that we say all the time is that we are creative climate justice storytellers, and that's what we do is, like you were saying, Lisa and Tracy, you know, try, um, trying to really speak to our own experiences and amplify our own voices is what we're trying to do. Um, and so I was born in India and I was raised in Oman in, in the Middle East, and it was a uh, it was a pretty wild experience. We lived at the heart of the fossil fuel industry, um, but 80% of the country's economy was based on the petroleum industry and oil was 10 times cheaper than drinking water. Um, and growing up, you know, at the same time, this was, there was this kind of dichotomy of growing up somewhere in the middle of the desert where it was so hot in days that we couldn't go outside and also living at the heart of, of petroleum development. And when I was 17, I, I moved to the US for, for university. And you know, my expectation was being from India that I would freeze for four years and then return home. But I think what I didn't expect was how radically my understanding of climate change and, and community would grow over time. Um, and a lot of this happened um, you know, at the UN climate conferences. And so from, from teachers and mentors and other activists, I, I learned about climate justice and the fact that, you know, the fossil fuel industry and rich countries in the global north, like the UK, like the US, are the biggest historical emitters of greenhouse gases, despite having a very small fraction of the world's population. On the other hand, the people who are feeling the effects of climate change the hardest are the most innocent in its causation. It's people who have done the absolute least to cause these emissions. It's people of color, indigenous people, women, low-income families, and, and people in the global south. And I think that climate change is an innately unjust um, crisis. And that's very clear to a lot of people. And so, you know, a little under five years ago, I was at the UN climate conference in Paris with, with lots of other young activists like myself. And you know, it was supposed to be the climate deal to save us all. And, and the hype around it was unbelievable. And I remember you know, when the Paris Agreement came out on the 12th of December in 2015, people called it a monumental success for the, for the planet and its people and so many different things. Someone called it the most beautiful and peaceful revolution was something that I remembered. <laughs> and I remember sitting in the room while it was being gaveled through and, and you know, hearing all of these negotiators negotiate on my future and the future of the whole planet in, in front of me and you know talking about how we need to limit the world you know temperature rise to well below two degrees celsius um and at the same time the commitments currently that countries are making towards the Paris, who have made towards the paris agreement take us to a world that is four degrees warmer you know by the end of the century and so having a civilized world at that point feels very very difficult. A temperature increase of 1.5 degrees will be a tipping point where many vulnerable communities will lose their lives, entire islands will disappear, people will be really truly suffering through 1.5 degrees of warming and so four just feels so un unimaginable. And I remember as I was you know, watching my future and the rest of the world be negotiated on, um, a devastating hurricane and, and freak floods completely ravaged the city in India where my family lives and where they are right now. And um, 300 people died. I didn't hear from anyone I knew for two days. And I think that seeing my family as a frontline community was never a reality that I wanted to confront or sit with. And it really confirmed that yeah, I couldn't sit around and wait for any more climate change induced disasters to, to work on this. Um, for example, last year in the same city, we, we went through around seven months of not having any water 
and that's 7 million people with no water for seven months and trucks would bring them in and we had to pay for it. And, you know, violence broke out in the city, things that you expect to happen when there's a shortage of a very, very essential resource and something that everyone has a right to enjoy and to have and that they need for life. And I think that, you know, similarly drought is also what led to violence and unrest in, in, in Syria. Like we can look at so many different connections between climate change and unrest. And by 2030, 40% of India won't have access to water. And that's 40% of a billion people, which is a lot. And so I think to me, these numbers don't just feel like statistics. They feel like a very, very real lived experience. And I think if we talk about climate change as a future problem, we're already not, not doing it right because it's happening right now. And it has been happening for a while to frontline communities. And if we're not talking about it from a perspective of history, we're doing it even longer because there's centuries of, of capitalism and colonialism that have led to communities of color and indigenous people worldwide being systemically disadvantaged when it comes to life and just living. So many people have had their resources and their cultural wealth stolen from them in the past. And we see it happening today as well. I don't think it is a coincidence that toxic waste and fossil fuel runoff are mostly dumped into poor communities of color. And I don't think it's a coincidence that better schools, public transport, jobs, and grocery stores exist in areas where richer and whiter populations live in many countries. I think it's the work of a very intentional system rigged to benefit a small handful of people. And no one wants to hear that inconvenient truth, right? And I think this is the new inconvenient truth. It's not climate change. It's the fact that the actions of, of rich countries and the fossil fuel industry and the wealthy comes at the expense of real lives and real bodies um, of people that are environmental defenders, people who are from communities of color, indigenous communities. And I also think that something myself and other young people who are organizing for, for climate justice in our communities and internationally really believe is that the climate crisis also presents us with a historic opportunity. And I think that this is a, a place that we're coming from, which is that as a part of a plan to get our emissions down, we are also being given a chance to push for policies that can dramatically improve our lives, that can close the gap between the rich and poor, that can create a huge number of jobs and that can really reinvigorate how we see the world and how we see our relationships to each other from the ground up. And even if it is an unyielding deadline, it's also a push that it's a really intersectional push that brings together all of our strong existing movements. You know, our movements for women's rights, for tribal sovereignty, for racial justice, jobs and welfare all come together, I think, within the climate justice movement when we're saying, you know, the right to a clean and healthy environment is the right to life. It's the right to have all of the things that that make us joyful, that make us want to, to build a world together. And I think that that's what's feels really important because currently our status quo economy is leaving millions behind, right? It's padding the pockets of corporate polluters and billionaires. It's exposing working class families, communities of color and others to stagnant wages, toxic pollution, dead end jobs. And, and that's why it's so important for us as people on the front lines of crisis to be the forefront of change. And I think that that's what feels really important to me about environmental defenders work. And I think that young people facing the climate crisis have deserved to have this voice and opportunity to really deeply collaborate with others who have been working for climate justice for, for years and for us to be able to also as young people from very vulnerable communities be able to, to lead that conversation. And I think that um, I feel really grateful that's something that we're doing right now within, within Sustain Us. Um, uh, our leadership, our membership, it looks like the people who are on the front lines of the crisis and they're the ones who are, who are really leading our work. We have members who are stopping pipelines in their communities. One of them is suing the US federal government along with 20 other young people on the basis of climate change. Others do organizing work around how um, queer young people in Jamaica live in low lying sewers to escape persecution um, from, from people who, who are not respectful of them. Um, and, you know, they are organizing because they, while they're living in the sewers, climate change is flooding and affecting them even harder. Um, and it's sustain us. We've also spent a lot of time disrupting the, the Trump administration and dip, disrupting panels that the Trump administration has put on um, you know, where they say dirty energy and coal are part of the climate solution. And we've done that for the last few years at the UN Climate Conference, where we've, you know, occupied the room, laughed at them and said that, you know, 
if you think the fossil fuel uh, fossil fuels are part of the solution to the climate crisis, then um, here are the stories that you need to hear instead. Like here are the people working on the ground um, to to protect their land, to protect their culture, and to to protect their people. And I think that obviously human rights and the environment are are deeply linked. And and um, something that's really stuck with me is. Uh, something that a mentor of mine told me, his name is uh, Nemo Basi, and he worked, uh, speaking of environmental defenders with, with Ken Sarawiwa and the Ogoni people um, in Nigeria against, against Shell. Um, and he said to me, you know, human rights and the environment are deeply linked. We need both for survival and life. And um, so that's the perspective that we come from. Thank you, Anissa. And sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you um, in, in the context of amplifying voices of, of the people. So I want to break in there. But um, thank you so much for that. That's that's fantastic. And again, this message about um, how the making sure that we acknowledge that there are voices out there and that we need to listen to these voices. Um, and also the fact that there is this knowledge out there that people are experiencing these things already and that, that this needs to be, be kind of somehow made its way to the policymakers. Um, so I'll come back to that, but also some questions about that shortly. Good, okay. Um, Gabriela Bese, I have to, I'm not sure if I pronounced your last name, but she's the regional director for Latin America. And uh, I just lost my, notes so let's see if I got that as a screen change um, for Latin America and the Caribbean at um, Youth for Nature and Gabriela is also part of an NGO in Natal Brazil uh, and she's been involved with urban activism and has been advocating for active mobility public transportation and protection of oceans and forests as well as for urban planning based on nature um, that addresses inequalities and respects people's self-determination. So, uh, Gabriela, you have a few slides here, and yeah, please go ahead. Hello, I'm really happy to be here to have this invite to talk to you all. I'm learning a lot, and I hope I can bring some knowledge to all of you today. So, I'm part of Youth for Nature, the youth youth organization that uh, works to empower young people and also tell their stories. Uh, when we're talking about Latin America, I'm bringing the perspective of my region, Latin America and the Caribbean. And when you're talking about it, we have to talk about diversity. Yes, we are one of the uh, regions that congregate six of the 17 mega diverse countries in the world, according to Conservation International. But beside that, we are also a region that has a diversity of people, colors, smells, and cosmovisions that have to be recognized and respected. And I think if we are capable to of embracing and respecting diversity and subjectivity of each uh, people, we are going to be capable of also achieving amazing and innovative things. The story of uh, land and environmental defenders in Latin America is a story of sorrow, but it's also, it's also a story of hope, and I want to bring both sides of this today. Um, Patrick already said amazingly the work of global witness about uh, the death of land and environmental defenders. And 2019, 212 uh, defenders were killed and two thirds of these people were in Latin America and the Caribbean. Even during the five days of COP25 last year, two indigenous people of, uh, they are part of Sonia Guajajara um, um, community were killed in the state of Madanhão in Brazil. And this is a, a recurring, uh, Thing that is happening in our region. And so I'm talking here also to, uh, is a, what I'm talking here is also homage to these, their front line in the front line of environmental conflict. And as was said before, these people are especially uh, people that are in the land, in the rural areas, in the forests, indigenous people, people of color, uh, quilombolas also here in Brazil. So, uh, in the death of these environmental defenders, this is, is a bit extreme because uh, these people, these people in me, I'm included, but I'm living in the city, so I'm more protected. And I'm also a white person. So, but these people are facing threats, harassment, arrest, and criminalization for peacefully protecting their land and our nature. And we need urgently to defend our defenders. And 
because they are giving their life for nature, for the nature. So these people in these photos are some of the iconic people here in Lac. They are uh, suffering from this violence. And, and this is really personal because I truly fear for the life of my friends and for my companions because um, even like my family, my father is an environmental activist and we already were threatened when we decided to go against um, uh, was farms, shrimp farms here in my region. So this is something that is really uh, present in the people that are uh, environmental defenders in Latin America and the Caribbean, but not only here, of course. Um, so just let me say something before. Uh, here in Latin America, we, have, we are trying to have an agreement uh, to, to take effect that is Kazoo Agreement and Skazoo's green agreement is really important for our region because uh, it will give the right of access to environmental information, to public participation in, that, in the environmental decision making, and also access to justice in environmental matters. Uh, the agreement still needs ratification of one signatory country to take effect, uh, but actually we need more than just an agreement. We need a accountability to those responsible. What well, has already been said about uh, some of these responsible, so we're talking about uh, people with a lot of power that uh, are in general involved with uh, big companies and big industries. And because these deaths, they are a consequence of a way of living, a predatory system that uh, wants to consume more, uh, it's never satisfies satisfy and operates by a logic of oppression, power, and greed. And in like in for the purpose of profit, they are taking human lives and destroying nature and we need to change this. So I brought here some sectors that are already said that are accountable for that, like mining and extraction, the agribusiness that is also related with the, is the fires that are happening in Latin America and the Caribbean, especially in the Amazon region, but also in Cerrado, Caatinga, and other parts of the, of the region. Um, and all, another conflict that it's also like uh, a big thing here is the water conflicts. Uh, it's, also, it's related with the droughts that are happening and also the construction of uh, hydroelectrics for energy uh, resource impact have impact the rivers and its communities that need uh, water from that rivers. Another thing that is also related um, what what is happening is the lifestyle that is, that we have in cities, especially when we're talking about what we, what people call developed cities, developed countries, because there's a growing necessity in these cities for more resource resources such as energy, water, and food, and other materials. In these pressures, the conflicts in the rural areas and forestal areas that are operating um, still with this kind of um, industry that it's really, uh, it really affects land and people. But also in cities, we see a change of reality. We see people uh, uprising and talking how they, um, uh, about these consequences. And Anissa already talked about, but uh, a little bit, but um, the, it is also reality in cities, the difference within cities. So we have people that are more affected there, and especially people that are in a vulnerability situation. Uh, we face a lot of environmental racism, not only here in Latin America and the Caribbean, so even um, so people of color, indigenous people and women, they are affected differently by, the, by these. But we are seeing the environmental defenders and other uprisings uh, talking about the need to shift in this. The colonization, the reality we live here is, is also a reality that is a consequence of the colonization that happened 500 years ago, but it's still ongoing. So, um, is the way of, we need really to change the, the ways we of thinking and talking about another visions of the world and bring them to the center. And so take, take it. Yeah. Thank you.
take all this together. And I think a hope, of course, is the stories that we have. We have amazing stories of people doing amazing things. And I think that's uh, what Youth for Nature wants to bring the stories of these people. So I talked a little bit here. I want to talk about the new story. That is a story uh, about um, a restoration of forests with a community-based approach. So not only uh, he brought education uh, to how to collect seeds and, and to bring forest restoration, but he also takes the knowledge that these communities have and bring to science and bring to these, um, these places. And I think it teaches us a lesson that the solutions for climate change will be found in broader strategies than merely outlying technical approaches. It is important to reduce social inequalities, poverty, and violence to also tackle uh, the environmental problems that we have. And access to education, I think, is a transformative path uh, for reshaping that. Uh, especially like uh, all levels of educational scenes uh, for kids and for, uh, for grown-ups. I think this is key for the change of paradigms, these paradigms that are disrupting the nature. So I just really um, passed by this story, but you can check in your for Nature website more stories about young people that are leading that and that are defending our land and our, our environment. And um, so Latin America is full of these stories of these environmental defenders that are, are doing this of grassroots movements, young people taking action, urban mobilizations, local communities that are restoring and protecting forests, rivers, and oceans. And my hope is with these people that are taking action with indigenous people, uh, people of color, quilombola that are facing the most brutal violences and are resisting and creating innovation continuously uh, that we need to, to talk about and to put in the front of, of the thing. So uh, to finish that, I want to, as Emma Goldman said, I want freedom, the right to self-expression, everybody's right to beautiful radiant things. Because it's despite the threats, Latin America, Caribe region faces because of interest of, of some that have power and greed. We are people that are not willing to give up. We are fighting because this land is not dirty, is a fertile soil. So the dunes, the mangroves, the oceans and the forests, they also raised me. They are part of who I am and they're actually part of who we are, we all are. And fighting to, for them and for the right of all people to be listened to and included in the decision-making process is really important to me. I really believe in a bottom-up politics, and I think we have to look at, for examples in Rojava, the Mapuches, Los Zapatistas, local communities that are organized organize in a different way. And if you look closely in Latin America and other places in the world, you will find the ideas that are going to postpone this end of the world, actually the end of humanity. So um, we are going to sing and dance, and with this, we're going to resist and defend our nature and our people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gabby. Thank you for also putting that message of hope at the end, because I think it's important. We all need that right now. These are tough things to, to think about. And, um, and so I, I think, you know, we've got some, a couple of, in, of questions coming up here. People really want to understand how this works. Um, we're talking about the subaltern, and the people who have not, who don't have access to, to power, who are through this systemic sort of colon, colonialism and, and um, other historical processes are, not in positions of power to be able to, to make decisions. But at the same time, we have lots of examples here of people who are taking action and are having an impact. Um, so uh, I guess what I would like to hear, and, and I think this is something that um, kind of echoes some of the, the questions that are coming up in the Q&A here a little bit, is really uh, how do we concretely identify the way in? So how do we access these closed or by invitation only spaces 
uh, of negotiation so that we can can assert power on the key actors for change. Uh, um, Anissa, you talked about going to the COP and 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 so on. And, but I guess concretely, how do we best push for change? And one of the, the, the reasons why this is important, I think, is because a lot of messages are, like I said, quite tough to listen to. I mean, if you know, and, and there's been quite a lot of discussion um, all over social media, but also in the news about how uh, climate activist groups are sending really extreme kind of doomsday messages. And, and what extent, to what extent does that discourage people from being active? And um, clearly, you know, if people are being killed because of their activism, but there are lots and lots of people out there still doing it. So there's something that keeps people going. But I guess the question is, how do we ensure that we to, to get, you know, these messages to policymakers without um, provide as kind of painting such a, a gloomy picture that nobody really wants to carry that message forward? Um, or rather saying it from the other side, that policy mess, um, makers feel overwhelmed and they don't know even how to start, start start taking action. So what do you think are these kind of the the the, the methods to to kind of access these closed and invited or invited only spaces? Um, maybe, yeah, Tracy, maybe you want to say something about this. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I think uh, the question was looking at international NGOs and uh, others and uh, the spaces as well. The challenge we have is that most times we are looking at global spaces and we forget that issues come right from the ground. If we look at the UNFCC negotiations, you'll find that it's the parties that are allowed in the negotiation rooms. But before the COP happens, there are processes at country level where the governments are collecting feedback in country. And those are the processes that we miss most of the time. And then they come with positions that are not informed by other actors across society. And by the time it comes to the global level, it's then too late to make any contributions. So I think we really need information on the processes that happen right from national level and where there are spaces for civil society and other actors to engage and give feedback and give evidence. And governments really like the LDC governments are committed on taking on some of that evidence because they need the evidence to make their cases stronger, but then they don't get it. So of course, uh, challenges of coordination at national level. And most of the activists sometimes will not have the information that the discussions already happened. And not even only at national level, the other pre-COP meetings that happen even internationally. And sometimes we miss all those opportunities. So looking at the COP itself is not the solution. We need to look at all policy making decisions right from the local level up to the global level. I think that would be useful. And then um, the support to, to the environmental defenders by NGOs and others, I think this is a fight that we all need to be part of and to identify what role that each of us can do. Like the university is already brokering space for discussion and information. The, the international NGOs, most of the funding goes to international organizations, but in their country strategies, do they really focus on environment or climate change? If they don't, then definitely the work of defenders will not be a priority for them. I think this awareness, and the integration of climate and environment into programming as part of good development really is important so that they're able to support their capabilities or fund their interventions or do the convening because I, international NGOs are more respected at country level and have the, they can convene the local organizations and negotiate spaces with them, not really like uh, speaking for them but creating the spaces for them to engage and strengthen their agency. But I think it's something that everybody needs to be part of, not just international organizations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Anissa, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say that like as someone who has done most of their, I guess, work at the international level, I completely agree with you, Tracy. I feel like this is a multi-step intersectional um, movement that, and it needs, it, 
I feel like the climate crisis hurts everyone and it, it is like everyone's responsibility to a certain degree to engage in this conversation and make sure that the right communities are being um, prioritized in a way that is equitable given, given how they've historically been treated. And I think that um, it goes from even your most local level council to the international level, like we just see the same problems replicating themselves at different scales. And so it's very important to have um, the actual input from from frontline communities um, who are who are the victims of of the of the kind of I guess, difficulty that the climate crisis brings. And so they should be the ones to lead the process on, on responding to it as well. Super, thanks. Patrick, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of things. I think that having been around for a very long time on the op opposite end of the, the youth, youth aspect of this now, I'm sort of getting to be the pastor aspect of this, but anyway, um, I think that one thing I've seen over the years in campaigning is that there are some arguments which are unarguable. You could, there are some arguments where you know there, there are two sides, there's a balance, and, and you need to really push your point. I think one of the things with land and environmental defenders is it's an unarguable argument, i.e. no one, no business can defend their practices if people are being murdered or physically attacked or criminalized. They might try to, but they can't. They can't actually get away with it if you really press them in the right place. And we've noticed, you know, when we started documenting the numbers of people being killed, a phenomenal amount of press interest, more so than most of our other work. And I think it's because it's a window for a lot of people who may not be really into these issues, into what the real cost is. Um, obviously, the climate is a cost, but as we know, that's sometimes hard to communicate to people because perhaps you can't see it, although it's becoming increasingly visible. But if you get, you know, someone like Berta Castres in Honduras, uh, you know, a, a mother um, murdered for what she does, then people can really relate to that. Um, and I think it's it comes back to the point I made earlier that really amplifying the voices and the experiences of those people is, is a, a very powerful way through this. And, and conversely, the reputational damage, and there are loads of things I could say about legal remedy and everything else, but the reputational damage to businesses um, to be, um, you know, recognized as being, you know, uh, part of the problem of, of killings or attacks, depending on the business, some don't care, but high profile businesses, it's an issue. And all of those things, I think, are, are tools in the, in the campaigner's tool chest that can help address these things. Thank you. Uh, Gabby, also, if you want to have... I'll just add some stuff. Uh, you had said beautifully about it, but... Uh, we have to protect nature, but we have to look at people. If we're just looking at nature and, and you're not looking to local communities and these people that are frontline, uh, we have to think. Since the audience, I think it's um, since the, with the research was really European, I think it's also important to take a look at uh, the companies and how they are responsible for a lot of matters and also governments, how these governments, especially governments that are in Europe with more, this with more money and more power also, they are investing in some in mining and other activities that are really harmful for these, uh, for environmental defenders and for nature as a whole. So I, I also, I think it's, it's really important to pressure to a participation where people are listening, that people are, are uh, actually um, actively participating in the decision-making process. And also I have been thinking how we can start to uh, fund more of these local places, these local communities, because sometimes I see people that they don't have like enough structure and enough uh, money even to invest in being, uh, being um, legally, legally an organization, but they actually need a lot of help. So how can we reach those people and 
sometimes I start putting money in these small uh, local communities and organizations and, and not only in governments that sometimes have, have different interests than only people in nature. Thanks, Gabby. So um, I'm just going to ask one more question, then I'm going to turn. But one of the questions has come up in the the, the Q and A as well, and and it was something that actually Tracy mentioned at the beginning, which which is something I think a lot about as well, and which is really sort of the fact that we have people at the front line who have a lot of knowledge, people who have a lot of experience, and this experience and this knowledge doesn't get put into peer review papers, and therefore, and I'm saying this as as somebody who's involved as an author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we have, this is the, the, the sort of the forum for the, the science that we use is from peer review information. The, the IPCC reports then go to serve as, as help for governments making policy on climate change. But a lot of this information doesn't get included because it isn't in the right format. And I think um, this, the question here, and because we have so many people who are from university, um, the question is really, what is the role of the researcher or what is the role of science here? I mean, Tracy, you started to mention this and I think, but I, I guess the question is really, you know, we, um, to what extent can we amplify these voices, uh, which is with, with knowledge that isn't actually ours, it's, it's somebody else's knowledge. And so I guess I'm curious how uh, we can support to bring that knowledge to the place where it needs to mate and mate and, and help to put it in a format that it that um, speaks to uh, decision makers. Maybe Tracy, you want to start because this is you start you talk a lot about this. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, this is really a question that uh, needs to be addressed. At IID, uh, we work a lot with the least developed countries group on adaptation initiatives and uh, negotiations at the UNFCC. And one of the long-term initiatives for the LDC group is the formation of a least developed countries university consortium on climate change. And this was formed from the realization that all the knowledge was like from the North to the South. We need to build an adaptation plans. A consultant should come from the UK or the US so all the consultants were coming from outside and that was limiting capacity internally for governments to be able to plan and work on policies and stuff. So these universities in country, there's a plan for the universities to work with the governments and support adaptation and implementation of the Paris Agreement. And alongside that, uh, at IID, we also work with social movements and we've had discussions with, between social movements and universities on how universities can support co-creation of knowledge using uh, information that communities already had. And some of the discussions were around um, co-designing research with community based on their needs and their issues. They may not have the tools for data, collecting the right data, or how it can be formatted either into policy briefs or whatever to go to government. So then they can co-design such studies with universities and universities can support documentation of those in two policy positions that organizations can use to discuss with policymakers around that. And there's also an opportunity for learning uh, that, the, the issue of champions, we really need champions, especially the youth that will understand issues of climate and environment and how to communicate about them in their communities, in their organizations. And that's a role that universities can also uh, play. Not the classroom based knowledge of uh, high technical staff, but understanding what are the needs and what kind of skills do they need to be able to communicate in a way that others will understand, but also creating climate leadership at government or civil society, having people that are really committed and have the skills to take that forward. We've seen a lot of activism recently. And uh, one time the OECD organized uh, a global forum and we we're looking at issues of gender and the environment and youth engagement. And the youth were expressing themselves and saying, you know, we, we have the spaces, we are part of the activism, but we don't even know what the climate policies say. We don't know the targets. We don't know the priorities. We hear about NDCs and NAPs 
and that's it. So there's a lot that universities can really do in terms of supporting capabilities of the defenders of the youth and other groups. Thank you, Tracy. So I just want to say, uh, if anybody else wants to, to comment on that, I'm just going to tell the attendees that you, I'm not, after this, I'd like to hear a live question, <laughs> hear somebody's voice out there. So um, if you want to raise your hand, I think you should be able to do that in the, in the, I'm not sure if you have that actually option to raise your hand, but um, anyway, we'll, we get that out yes at the bottom okay yeah okay somebody's already done it so good all right good so um good so does anybody else on the panel want to address this issue of knowledge anisa okay yeah definitely i think that it comes down to a question of what kind of knowledge is valued and whose knowledge is valued i think that um in my experience, being in academia for the last year has been quite, quite hard because I think that academia is an extremely, um, can be an extremely elitist space. It can be a very difficult place to, to enter and to be taken seriously. Um, if you don't speak the right language, if you don't, you know, write in the right ways. And I think that that's extremely, extremely difficult. And, and I think, Tracy, what you're saying is, is really true. When I was in when I was in university, I was extremely lucky as um, like a youth climate activist to also be given classes learning about climate policy so that then the work that I was doing very much was then translating academia and, and very tough policy language into language that, that people in communities can understand um, who haven't really studied it. And I, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity for that. And, and it also goes the other way where I think um, at my job at Oil Change International, a lot of what we do is um, work with people in, in frontline communities, in least developed countries, in in basically uh, countries and places that don't have the capacity or, um, you know, the, the, I guess, prioritized know-how of, of how to enter these spaces and then kind of take their on the um, on the ground experiences and then formulate that into language that think that can then be used in more, I guess, quote unquote, professional spaces. So I think there's that kind of translation going on um, between, between, I guess, more academic communities and, and non-academic communities. But I think, yeah, the question feels particularly difficult and, and frustrating because it's such a such a real lived problem where people are not and, and indigenous communities and communities of color who have known for, for so many centuries how to deal with the climate crisis and how to adapt to it and so many other things have not been able to uh, be taken seriously because it's just not in the right format. Yeah, absolutely. So that that's actually a really important message about the both ways and how uh, we as researchers can very quickly also exclude uh, people from from the discussion because or from the conversation because we speak our own language. Um, anything to add, Gabby and Patrick, on that as well? Or, yeah, Patrick, please. Yeah, very quickly. I, I think another aspect of knowledge is is actually finding out what people want. Um, I know as a as an activist and campaigner that when on, on many issues, whether we're looking at illegal logging or deforestation or working on defenders, we're very often branded as um, anti-development um, or, you know, the government of whatever country it is wants to bring wealth to those pre people jobs. They want to be developed, you know, uh, and the guy I mentioned earlier, who, who sadly died of COVID, Santos, who spoke in, in Oxford last year, he said, the World Bank tell me that my people are poor. Um, he said, this has come some, to some, uh, some surprise to us. You know, we have all the food we want. We have clean water. Um, we live in harmony with nature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're not poor. Um, and, but, you know, you guys are living in little boxes in London. I think you're poor. Um, uh, you know, so I think to bring that, it's, it's, it's knowledge, but it's also an opinion it's a point of view what do people want it's we can't you know it comes back to this area uh, uh, the subject of decolonizing things you know we, the the international development agencies uh, international aid programs have a particular worldview which is way out of date okay yes thank you um 
Good. Okay, Gabby, if you had any thoughts as well. Um, really, really quickly, I just add that I think it's also um, an ongoing paradigm shift that we need because now, now we see developing as like uh, everybody, uh, as money, as economy, but as Patrick said, that are people that for them, this, they need other, they have other necessities and sometimes um, uh, we have to see if they are attended. Um, I think um, the academia is also an elitist place. Some people get there and some people can't get there. And this start, like, this is really here when you're Latin American Indian, when you have a few people that go to university and then even go to the, the like to continue their studies. And I think it's important to try to listen to other researchers, try to like, go out of the, of the North uh, knowledge and because there are researchers like here in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia that are, uh, have another point of view that I think are really interesting. And Danilo, the one that I presented the story, Danilo Ignacio, he's also, uh, actually a researcher that has been bringing um, this community-based approach to listen to people. So I invite you to maybe take a look of what he's doing and other people are already doing to bring these voices to science and maybe get inspired by them. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna ask Sammy Erin, who's got her hand raised, so she wants to ask a question. Hi, so um, I'm with a nonprofit called The Resilient Activist and our purpose is to provide emotional health support for people who are in the environmental world, knowing that there are organizations now like the Climate Psychiatry Alliance and Climate Psychology Alliance, whose main focus really is on the rest of the population, you know, climate grief, existential angst, and so on. But the needs of the environmental activists are different from the general population who are concerned about what's happening. So we've started a research study at the University of Kansas on the emotional health of environmental activists. It's very new. And I'm just wondering, I, I guess I would like to say from the educational perspective that for those people who are teaching young people how to be environmental activists and what they need to do and learn and know that I'm hoping that there's also a movement to provide mental health support, resilience tools, trauma training, mindfulness practices, and that kind of thing, so. Okay, thank you, excellent. So this, yeah, this brings us into um, space. We haven't actually gone through so much yet, I guess. Um, does anybody want to take a stab at that? Um, yeah. I, listen, I mean, the, the comment I can make is that um, there, there are so many issues around climate and environment. And climate is really cross-cutting across sectors. It's a food security issue. It's a water issue. It's a sanitation issue. It's a health issue and all. So we've been talking a lot about resilience but we don't go deep into understanding what does resilience really mean. If we have programs that are focusing on resilience, then they are looking at people, they are looking at the economies, they are looking at ecosystems as an integrated approach, then you would be able to address all those issues that come into that perspective as part of the program. And uh, I also want to acknowledge that not every organization will have the skills. So the partnerships of working with different groups to bring the whole story together becomes important. There are those that might have skills on psychosocial support and others have skills on research and others, but how do we work together in partnership to have the story? At IID, we usually hold uh, what we call development and climate days in between the UNFCC negotiations. And we have different practitioners coming in, but the Red Cross and Red Crescent Climate Center have been bringing in the subject of uh, climate grief. How do you support people who have gone through a flood maybe that has destroyed their livelihoods, killed people and everything? It's, it's very emotional, but then you need to work with the experts that can support that area. 
So an integrated approach becomes really important. And those discussions are starting to emerge, which is uh, really useful. We'll see how it goes, but it's important as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, anybody else want to say anything about this? I, Gabby? Yeah. I would just uh, uh, say that I think it's an important topic uh, for the future of I think that is something that uh, at least where I am, you still don't have the tools to have this kind of support, but I think it's so important to have this and to really um, see how it is also different for the ones that are in the front line, they're in local communities and are facing this and for people that are involved in organizations. Um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing with this question that's quite interesting is, is even for those of us who are researching and climate change and also faced with a lot of difficult things, we don't often consider that we need to have this type of um, support, um, even though it's, it's very challenging as well. Um, okay, I'm going to turn to one of the questions that has gotten a lot of votes here, which is, I think, really interesting and looks, it's this from Frankie Lloyd. So, um, Let's see. So Frankie is asking, um, as someone with a history in LGBTQ and women's activism, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on bringing environmental activism into these spaces. Uh, what advice would you give to these groups who wish to engage climate discussions more in, into their discussions and activism? So yeah, so LGBTQ and women's activism as, as well as kind of intersecting with, with um, climate and environmental activism. Does anybody, Anissa? Oh, yeah. Just, um, yeah, thank you so much for the question, Frankie. I was actually just uh, typing you an answer, so I'm glad that you asked it out loud. Um, I think that, like I said before, it's very, like, it. the climate crisis is a sad, well, it's a sadly uniting crisis because we all um, are impacted by it but like we said before some communities are are so much more vulnerable to climate change and that's kind of where we make that connection in the um, in terms of intersectionality and talking about it so for example if I was talking about you know gender justice or women's rights and climate and the climate crisis um, the way that I would talk about it is that you know women are are amongst those who are the most vulnerable to, to climate change, difficulties that women you know, feel right now in terms of gender inequity, um, et cetera, will be so much more exacerbated and amplified with the climate crisis. So women do a lot of care-based work, including um, you know, taking care of families, including going out to get water, etc. And with the climate crisis, things like this become so much more difficult, disease rates increase, et cetera. And so, um, I think that's kind of the, the, the place from which you approach it. Um, I think similarly when, you know, when, and I think it's very important to, to not like reduce both those, you know, movements to just being like the climate justice movement is everything because, because I don't think that that's helpful, but I think that talking about it from a perspective of vulnerability, from a perspective of impact and, and um, I think also just, like for me, what feels very important about it is, is talking about it as different movements supporting each other as well and different communities coming together for, for what everyone is trying to build, which is, which is a future where we can all thrive. And I think that that, that is the best place to start with, uh, to start from uh, for, for almost anything. But I think that specifically around women's rights or LGBTQ, um, uh, LGBTQ rights, similarly, I was saying earlier that, um, in, for example, in um, Jamaica, somebody that I was working with before was talking about how, you know, young queer people in, um, in, in the city that they're in are very much, um, you know, kind of ostracized. And so because it's not acceptable um, to be outwardly queer, they end up often, um, you know, living living in in the sewers and then with increased climate change they become more vulnerable lose their homes more etc and so like that's another um like way to talk about it. okay super thank you yeah i mean this is, this is 
really important question. Um, if unless anybody else is burning to to respond to that, I'm going to maybe move to another question. Just to we've got a lot of questions, and I think it's it's nice for us to hear what the audience are thinking as well. Um, because I um, I'm going to kind of combine two questions here that have gotten a lot of votes. Be, um, there's a question asking how how do we um, Sorry, now this moving around in front of me. Um, yeah, okay. So I guess this is this is a question really because uh, we're talking about you know we well we and activists and and people at the front line and so on. So there are a lot of different actors here uh, with different roles. Uh, one of the questions is asking for those of us who are based in the UK who want to take action on the issues that are, that are presented how do you do this best? Is it best to support the land defenders and the activists overseas uh, using skills that we might have or, or to focus our efforts on research or political advocacy here in the UK? Um, yeah, and I guess this, this could apply more generally if you're thinking about, you know, if you're not one of these people who is really kind of at the front lines, how, how can you contribute to this best? And um, so I'd be curious what you think. What, what your suggestions are. And I think um, this would kind of maybe help us to round off the event as well and give people something that they can go and do afterwards. Um, Patrick, um, you want to say something? You... Who? Me? <laughs> go ahead, you're unmuted. So that's <laughs> techno technological advantage. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I, well, I think firstly, it depends on what you think you're good at. Um, if you're good at political advocacy, go do political advocacy. Um, if you think you can um, work with people on the front line, then do that. Um, I think that based in, you know, wherever you happen to be, but if, if we're based in Europe, then it's probably easier to go the advocacy route. And whether that's um, lobbying, MEPs in Europe or MPs in your own country, um, or whether it's actually contacting companies and letting them know you care. And I don't mean that in a particularly benign way, but I think one of the, going back to something I said earlier on about no company can afford to be seen to be a party to violence and repression publicly, it's very good for them to know that there's a constituency in their own countries or, or their own region which thinks the same thing. Um, so the message isn't coming from far away. I think there is, especially in this COVID related environment, it's not easy to directly support defenders um, in the countries that they're in. Logistically, it's a bit of a nightmare. And, and simply, you know, if, if there's an established group, then yes, you could contact them, you could donate to them, you could talk to them, ask them what you could do. But very often, these, as a lot of us know, you know, these are individuals, these are communities um, who may not may be very hard to contact at all. So there are pl plenty of logistical problems, but there are various coalitions um, in existence that one could go through to sort of offer what services you have, because there's certainly help needed. There's no doubt about that whether that's financial, communications, technical, security, there are so many things that are needed. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the coronavirus also because somebody else is asking, how do we do, how do we engage now that with these coronavirus restrictions? So that was excellent. Uh, Gabby, you also wanted to say something. Yeah, I think um, that's said a lot of things, but I think that people have to see what they are more comfortable with. So, and like, uh, and what makes you like, um, what uh, makes you, I don't know, excited to get involved? Uh, maybe there is a specific area or a specific topic inside environmental, because there are many different um, um, areas that you can get involved in. Like, and if you maybe you know some people that can't don't have time to get involved, but maybe they have money to fund uh, local organizations um, or even like bigger organizations. So I don't know, uh, try to look for um, these places where you can get more involved in health in different ways. 
Yeah, excellent. I guess I just to add to that, I guess one concern that I would have is um, going back to sort of the voices and, and amplifying the voices and, and um, you know, that we don't want to, um, and I'm sure you're not suggesting either, but there is, of course, this kind of white savior uh, notion out there. And I guess what I worry about is that coming from outside that we uh, appropriate an issue that that belongs to other people and who have the right to tell this story. Uh, what I mean, you mentioned, Gabi, that you know that that, that Brazil, a lot of people from all sorts of of um, ethnic backgrounds. And I was just curious. You also mentioned that you know that you're white. You're from the city, so maybe you've kind of encountered this at all. Yeah, I think it is it's like challenge that um, like I, I try to understand the place where I am, the privileges that I have, uh, but also knowledge that I, yeah, okay, I'm also from Latin America that have all these differences. Um, so uh, how, also I think that like when you get to an event, if it's scientific uh, about another topic also, how are these places bringing women, are bringing indigenous, are bringing people of color to talk? I think it's also important to like, look and really talk to people like, ah, why ah, you should next time, even if you're not involved in events, like talk to them and say like, next time you should invite more of these people because uh, also there's a thing that uh, people have a lot to bring and not only about the, this, um, um, about they have different topics they can bring knowledge to. So sometimes even if it's like, um, if it's going to talk about some, I don't know, um, women perspective, but sometimes uh, like this person can be a woman and bring, uh, bring light to other topics that uh, also have knowledge. So uh, I think it's also important to, to, to pressure uh, small places, but also like when we go to, decision-making places, who are the people that are there? So it make pressure that uh, we need to change these people who are making the decisions. But because uh, as I see, even here in Latin America, what we see is that we have mostly men, white men, cis, heterosexual, they are taking the decisions. We have a point of view and we need to bring these other point of views that are intersectional. So I don't know, I don't know if this answer, but... Uh, I think I want to bring this perspective. No, absolutely. I think that's important. Um, all right. I am then just going to move on. So we're just going to have a, see if I can get another question in here. Um, uh, I actually, there's a question here that I thought was quite interesting, which was, is there any way to make this issue less political? Um, and I, I guess it's, it's hard for me to imagine that because um, this is kind of, you know, as a critical social scientist, it's sort of, there's nothing that's not political, but, but um, I think the question is really, how do we reach um, kind of across to people who have a different worldview and who have, uh, who have a different social identity and who, who may not, who may see these kinds of issues as kind of um, uh, threatening to the kinds of things that they value. And um, do you think that it's possible to turn these kinds of, of um, kind of these these battles around so that you can actually represent them in a way that that will connect to those kinds of values that may may not immediately be there um, may may not be immediately obvious. Uh, do you, do you have any thoughts on this, uh, Anissa? You're nodding. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Let's Anissa. <laughs> Patrick Patrick put his hand up, so you can go ahead. After you. Um, I think to me, these conversations are always inherently political. It's about how you communicate it and how you approach it with other people. So I think that if you're talking to someone across the aisle, you should always, or who feels very differently about something, you start from start from a place of, of commonality and start from a place of talking about the things that 
um, are important to everyone. Things like family, home, nature, things that I think no matter what your what your political opinion or stance, um, it it those are things that matter to you. And if you are talking to someone from from that shared perspective and from that shared beginning, I think it feels it feels very different. Um, there's also a part of me that's just like, yeah, this is inherently political. This is a conversation about the climate crisis, and there are people dying every day. Um, <laughs> in and and sometimes, yeah, it feels really hard to me to think of it as an apolitical conversation. And so I often think of think of it as a um, a political conversation that stays political. But you started from a place of commonality before you get there. Um, Lisa, if I may mention something short to add on what Anissa said. As you said earlier, really, the world is political. But I want to flip it and say, can we call them governance issues then? Because politics happen at family level, because everybody has their own agency right to the community and be everywhere it is politics and negotiation of interests and spaces. So, but then it could be around the approaches. How do we look at the governance systems at local level, at national level and other levels? And of course we are looking at uh, the rights holders and the duty bearers. That's why it becomes political. There's somebody who is affected whose right must be met, and is somebody responsible for fulfilling that. That's what really makes it political. And we can't avoid that because people in decision-making and governance structures have to be put to task to implement these social contracts they have with communities and other groups. And uh, depending on the interest and the benefits of it, it can be tagged political, but indeed it's not really political. It's about meeting people's rights. It's a, a social issue. It's a justice issue. And, and that's not political really when you look at the outcomes. But when we're, you're talking to the companies that we've been talking about who want to do business that are not environmentally friendly, that don't think about the people, definitely they say it's politics. But then if you look at the person being displaced as well, it is not politics, it's a, an issue of survival, it's an issue of rights, it's an issue of their livelihoods. And then also we have all these commitments around the targets, we have to reduce uh, emissions and all that. We have all these carbon projects in developing countries and all. So one country is fighting to reduce emissions, but somebody else that is impacting them negatively. So definitely the activism comes up. So I think we need to define the politics, the governance and the rights and social justice issues within this whole campaign. Yep. Excellent, Tracy, thank you. Okay, Patrick, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree. These issues are often inherently political. Um, and I think there's this fine line if there is a line at all between politics and, and money. Um, and one of the things that you know I've noticed and we've noticed as an organization is that capitalism, and we're not an anti-business organization, but capitalism has gone, as we describe it, gone feral, um, become increasingly predatory. Um, and if companies believe, in fact, not just believe, but currently can exploit anything anywhere on the planet, um, whether it's rare earth from the seabed, um, land, grabbing land, uh, drilling oil under the Arctic, whatever. If there's no barrier to that, then we're all lost. It has to be curved. We can't hide from that. That's You could call that political. You could call it simply a reality. But the other side of that particular coin um, on, on the business aspect is you can make cases to business when they see the sense of it. And of course, in the climate perspective, this uh, issue of stranded assets now, um, there are plenty of fora, whether it's talking to the shareholders of an oil company who might have 80% of its assets stranded. Um, you know, you could, there are constituencies you can go to. When we first started our work on corruption, we didn't succeed, and then that was corruption in the extractive sector, until we got several trillion dollars worth of institutional investors supporting a business case for transparency. You need business on side a lot of the time, and a lot of the time business will be on the side because it makes sense. But 
But when it just gets to the ability to exploit, then it needs to be curved. It has to be. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am going to wrap up after this. So Gabby, if you wanted to have um, something to say on this as well. This is kind of... No, okay, good, fine. Then, um, yes, yeah, sorry, we've gone a few minutes over. I know that for, for the participants and also for the panelists, we said that we would end at seven. So I appreciate we had a lot of interesting questions and I'm sorry that we didn't get to go through them all, but I think it's even in a live setting, it would have been very challenging. Um, this has covered a lot of really exciting issues. And I have to say that before the meeting started, I, I put on Twitter, come and join us. Um, we're going to hear about something that's hopeful. And then I thought, oh, maybe it won't be so hopeful. But actually, I feel like we've we've succeeded in that and, and kind of showing also across a number of different organizations, the kind of people who are involved in this. And, and it think that we, who, those of us who are concerned about environmental destruction and climate change are at least kind of go and rest a little bit uh, more easy now knowing that there are so many people out there obviously who also need our support um, but um, yeah I want to thank the panelists who've been fascinating and I guess we probably could talk all night because there's so many things to cover also to the participants who who sent in questions and who um, who stuck out to the end here with all of the with this zoom um, technology um, and also the organizers for, for putting something like this together. So I think I'm just going to say thank you. And I'm not sure if there's anything else to say here, if anybody else is going to come. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm just going to uh, finish now. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks all. Take Bye. care.